Good morning. I wonder if you would uh, open up your Bibles at the book of Job. Um, if you don't know your Bibles terribly well, if you cut the Bible in half to Psalms, that's the way I do it, and uh, roughly in the middle, and then go to the book before, and I want to look over a period of a few weeks at this remarkable book of Job. We don't know when it was written, but it's regarded by many as the oldest book, uh, though we don't really know. He may, Job may have been a contemporary of Abraham, but we don't know. And it's about a man, and I'm sure most of you know, who is reduced to the basic essence of life. He loses everything. He loses his family. He loses his possessions. He even loses his own self-worth and uh, is reduced to nothing. I wonder what we would do if today we lost everything. You lost your house. You lost your health. You lost your family. I wonder what would our response be? You see, when you break it down, much of our lives are concerned with unimportant things, actually. <laughs> when you break them down, when you break it down to its bare essentials, much of our lives are spent on things that really are not vital or even necessary. But, uh, you know, the question arises with uh, poor Job, why does God allow such things? Why do, why do bad things happen to good people? You've heard that, too, haven't you? Why do children suffer from cancer? Why do atheists and people who are wicked seem to prosper? And that question is asked several times in the Scriptures. And Job himself asks it in chapter 21, verse 7. He says this. <clears throat> I wonder if someone would fetch me some water, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows carve and do not miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. Their little ones dance about. They sing to the music of timbrel and lyre. They make merry to the sound of the pipe. They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, leave us alone. We have no <clears throat> desire to know your ways. Well, have you ever asked that question yourself? Why do good people seem to suffer so often? And thank you very much. It's very kind. Thank you. Thanks. Well, let me read you a verse in Isaiah which you know very well. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He is greater and wiser than we are. That's the reason we worship him. That's why we're here this morning. He owes us no explanations. Do you agree with that? He owes us no explanations as to why people get ill. He owes us no explanations at all and will carry out his will whatever we think of it. Hallelujah. I'm glad we've got a God like that. Actually, he does all things well. Let's have a, a big uh, look at the first chapter, <clears throat> um, chapter 1. In the land of Uz, that's a peculiar place to live, isn't it, Uz? I'm from Uz. In the land of, we had a clue where it was, really. 
in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. All right, he was blameless. I think the authorised version said he was perfect and upright. And now we must not read into that word perfect the English understanding of the word. It's quite different. Um, uh, he wasn't a sinless man. He was a complete man. That's a better way of putting it. Um, he wasn't, obviously wasn't sinless. He said so later on, do you remember? He confessed that he wasn't sinless, what man is. It simply means he, com he was a complete man. He was an all-round man. If you met this man, you could trust him. If he said, I'll turn up at such and such a time, he'd be there. If he said, I'm going to do this for you, he'd do it. He was a man you could trust. He was a perfect man. He was a complete man. And he was upright. Now, why was that? Because he feared the Lord and shunned his uh, evil. He looked to God and therefore his relationship with men and women was right. That's always the order. If we look to God, our relationship with others ought to be right. Maybe it's not always, but we need to put that right if that is the case. And God had blessed him. He'd got ten children, seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 female don donkeys and a large household. Now his sons apparently liked to party and uh, they would often meet together. And uh, Job would pray for them that uh, if they'd sinned, well, God would forgive them and he would offer sacrifices. So that's the beginning of Job. That's what we read about him. And uh, the next thing is we go to the throne room of God and the story begins to unfold in heaven when God calls a council meeting. And um, his angels, I've got this... Uh, picture of them queuing, you know, they're queuing up for their orders. They're queuing up for what God has got for them today. And in that queue is Satan. In that queue is the devil. And uh, isn't it wonderful that even the devil has to serve God? I remember when at Kid Screen someone set light to the church and people were sort of going on a little bit about it, I was able to say to them, well, even Satan must serve God. He hasn't got a free hand. He can't do exactly as he wants. He is subject to God. And we read this in verse 6 to 12. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does, God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You do understand that uh, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, don't you? And know that. That's one of his, I was going to say one of his functions, one of his malevolent functions. He's there to accuse. 
You'll find that Satan speaks only three times in the Bible. We'll come on to that maybe later. Can you think of the occasions? I'm, I'm not going to go into it now. You can do that yourself. Um, but he speaks on only three occasions. Now, he's presented himself there as the accuser of the brethren. God says, what have you been doing? Well, I've been roaming about, you know. I've been up and down like a lion, seeking whom I may devour. He's doing that this morning. Uh, do you remember um, Peter in his, um, in his uh, epistle said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, <clears throat> seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, I've been in meetings when people have been shouting at Satan. He couldn't care less. In fact, we are told not to rebuke him. You know that, don't you? It's not our job. <laughs> He's stronger than us. Let God deal with him. I've heard people shouting and shouting, you know, and, and rebuking him. It's nonsense. In fact, we are told in the New Testament that's precisely what we should not do. You remember the scripture, even the angel, the archangel. We won't go into it now. All right, so Satan is not sitting on his throne in the flames of hell with a pitchfork and a scepter. All right. He's a fallen angel, but he's under the authority of God who has set him limit limits. And uh, God said, have you considered? Now, this is a military term used of a general to a general sizing up a city. He's, he's, he's considering it. He, uh, how many people are there? What sort of ammunition? What sort of arms have they got there? This is the sense of it. Have you considered him? Have you looked at his weak points? Have you looked at the life of Job? Well, Satan had done just that. He'd done his homework. He knew Job and his reputation on the earth. And Satan says, it's hardly surprising, God that he loves you and follows you because you've given him everything. You've put a hedge about him. You've blessed him. But now strike out your hand and everything he has and he will curse you. Don't lay a finger on him, said God. And then we get to verses 13 to 19. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said the oxen were ploughing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, can you imagine this succession of awful news? While he is still speaking, another messenger came. The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are all dead." And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Can you imagine receiving that news? Can you imagine for a moment receiving that awful news? Everything's gone. Everything's gone. Verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. Oh, God, bring that word to our attention in this day and generation when he's just been so diluted and adulterated. 
and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. What a godly man. What a great man. What a marvellous testimony. Several years ago, I got very tired of modern worship. And I wrote an article, if you want a copy, I'll send it to you, about what worship really is. It isn't singing or clapping our hands. That may be a part of it. It's a tiny part. And uh, I argued that no word had become so cliched in church life than this word worship. Now there's a principle, I've mentioned this before, there's a principle in Bible interpretation which is called the principle of first mention. That is the first mention of a word indicates its meaning throughout the rest of scripture. And, and I, I point out and have pointed out here before in Genesis 22, Abraham is near Mount Moriah with Isaac. And he says to his men, we're going to worship. And he had a knife in his hand, ready to plunge it into his son. Oh, God deliver us from this trivia, which we call worship today. And let us get back to the truth of these things. Stay here with the donkey, said Abraham. Uh, um, and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back with a knife in his hand. Well, he, Job's heart was breaking and he worshipped. Has your heart broken lately? I, I, you know, we all go through it, don't we? We all go through it. We're all struggling with something or other. What's your response? Worship. Worship him. When everything seems against you, when everything seems to be wrong, when, when heaven is set up, is, is shut up like brass, worship him. Hallelujah. Satan comes a second time in chapter 2, verse 1. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself. And the Lord said, Where have you come from, Satan? And said, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and to and forth on it. Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one on the earth like him, blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Now, psychologists will tell us that the, the, the strongest instinct in us is self-preservation. It's probably true, isn't it? It's, it's, it's one of the, if not the strongest instincts in mankind, self-preservation. And now Satan strikes Job's with Job with boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And Job is in agony, sitting on the dump that's what he's doing. He's sitting on a dump. Can you imagine that? Where all the rubbish is burnt. That's more likely where he was. And he's scraping his boils with broken pieces of pottery. He's sitting on a pile of ashes. And Job's wife comes along and says, chapter 2, verse 9, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he did. Now remember, her heart was broken too. She gets a bit of bad press, you know. Her heart was broken. She had lost ten children. She had seen the business go to nothing. 
She'd been left with nothing, as it were. Let's have a little bit of sympathy for her. And uh, she, uh, she says, look, finish it all, Job. You can't go on like this. You'd be better dead than alive. Poor old Job, because the response that she gave just brought more wretchedness uh, on him. Now let me stop and ask a question. If Satan is subject to God, why does he not put an end to him now? Why does he not put an end to him causing all this trouble? If in the final analysis he's going to be cast into a lake of fire, into a bottomless pit, why not do it now? Have you thought the same thing? Why not do it now? Well, now let me put it this way. God created you and me as objects of his love. That's right. That's why he created you, as an object of his love. He wants you to be loved by him. Hallelujah. And he created you to reciprocate that and love him. And he wants you to willingly love him. He's not prepared to make you a robot, an automaton. He created you to willingly love him. And in order to receive that love, there must be free will. With all that goes with it, God must provide an alternative choice so that you can rebel. What are you, who are you, are you rebelling this morning? Choose, the, choose you this day whom you will serve. What's your choice? God or Satan? Life or death? Light or darkness? I've made my choice. Have you made yours? That choice exists this morning. You can settle for the kingdom of Satan or choose the kingdom of God. Well, then his three friends turn up. These three famous friends who also have a little bit of bad press, I think, at times. And um, Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar heard what had happened and they came to him. This man who'd been the greatest man in that part of the world. And they found him sitting in the dump, scraping himself with bits of broken pottery, and they didn't recognize him. And they tore their clothes, and for seven days <clears throat> they sat there quietly with him. I've been thinking about this. We were with a friend who's dying yesterday. Sometimes it's better not to say very much. Sometimes it's better to be quiet. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise we come forth with platitudes. Sometimes it's just good to say anything. Just to be there. Thinking we were tiring him out, we said, look, Dave, we'll go now. He didn't want us to go. He has a serious lung disease. I said, all right, we'll stay, but don't talk. Let's just sit here. And he said, it's just good to have you there. There he is. Now, from reading on in the book, we know what he was suffering. He was suffering intense pain. My bones are pierced in me at night and my pains take no rest. His skin was peeling and going black. My skin, he said, grows black and falls from me. Excuse me, pus was erupting from his sores. He says, my flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. 
He was losing weight. Bones clings to my skin and to my flesh. He got fever. My bones, he said, burn with fever. He was depressed. Have you ever been depressed? Have you? Well, you're in good company. Because this wonderful godly man was depressed. He said, I loathe my life. My heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. My face is flushed with weeping. Insomnia. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise and the night be ended? Nightmares. Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions. Putrid breath. My breath is offensive to my wife. Failing vision. Rotting teeth. Intense itching. Lasting for months. Hallelujah. What a man. What a man. And he knew nothing of what was happening in heaven. And for seven days his friends sit with him as he's in this awful condition. And then in chapter 3 the silence is broken and Job begins to speak. It's almost poetic. It's almost Hebrew pro poetry. He opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Verse 1. And Job spoke and said, May the they may the day perish on which I was born. Blot it out, Lord. Blot my birthday out as if it never existed. I don't want there to be any remembrance of me. I don't want there to be any, any birthday cards. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that day forgotten and completely erased from history. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of that day terrify it. As for that night, may not darkness seize it. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter of soul who long for death, but it does not come? My groanings pour out like water. And what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for troubles come. Now, some ridiculous and to me offensive preachers will suggest this was all Job's fault. That what he did was exercise a negative confession. Have you heard it? No? Oh, well, I've been with people when they say, oh, you must, you must be positive, you must exercise a positive confession because that which you say positively will come to pass. Utterly ridiculous. Utterly blasphemous in the case of this poor man. If you say things are going to happen badly, they'll happen. In other words, your words have got some ability to produce something. No, they haven't. The only one whose words can produce anything is God himself. Hallelujah. There is power in the tongue, of course, to offend, to upset. I'm not saying that. No power to create. And they take from Job this wonderful lesson that we're learning again this morning. There's another thing here. And... Uh, some people like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists have formulated a doctrine which they call soul sleep. Have you heard of that? Well, they believe that they, when, a, when a believer dies, they lie in the grave until the resurrection. A soul sleep. It's something that uh, <coughs> they get from the words of Job. He says this in verse 11. For now I would have lain still and be quiet. I would have been asleep. 
Now the last place to take such a doctrine is in the words of a man who was suffering so. That's absurd. We must look at the New Testament, we must look at the rest of the scriptures to find out what happens when a person is, uh, dies. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, So we are always confident that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So those who have lost people, they are present with the Lord this very moment and the last place they would want to be is back on this earth. Hallelujah. They're in a wonderful place. And Paul says again in Philippians, now listen to this one, Paul said this, but I am hard pressed from both directions having the desire to depart and to be with Christ for that is very much better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. I'm quite sure Paul would prefer to stay on the earth rather than, than to sleep in the grave for 2,000 years. He was looking forward to being with the Lord. You remember what God said, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Will we recognize our loved ones? Sheila and I often joke about this. She said to me this morning, Lev, if, you know, if you go before me and I, can we, can we still be together? Do you know that, do you know those, do you know that sort of thing? Are we, are we going to recognize each other? Are we? Yes. Oh, quite. Yes. When Moses and Elijah met with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were recognized as having bodies. And in Revelation, we read about the martyred dead are represented as wearing robes and being before the throne of God. Yes, we will recognize each other. Yes, those who have passed before have gone to be with the Lord. I look to you widows this morning to say, yeah, your beloved is with the Lord now. Take heart. He's with, they're with the Lord now, rejoicing. I think looking down, it seems to me in Hebrews, that great cloud of witnesses might be them looking down and urging you, keep going now. Keep going. Even when your heart's breaking, keep going. Keep going. I'm okay. I'm doing all right. Let me finish with a poem by Mary Kimbra. I mention that as passing, by the way, because I think it's important to, to, to understand those things. Though he slay me, I will trust him, said the sainted Job of old. Though he try me in the furnace, I shall then come forth as gold. Though the worms of deep affliction cause this body to decay, in my flesh I shall behold him, my Redeemer, some glad day. Though he slay me, can I say it? When I feel the searing fire, when my fondest dreams lie shattered, gone my hope and fond desire. Though he slay me, I will trust him, for he knows just how to mould, how to melt and shape my spirit. I shall then come forth as gold. Wasn't that a lovely song? Olga and the children sang, I know that my Redeemer lives. Those are the words of Job, aren't they? <laughs> I don't know whether you did that on purpose. Uh, they're great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for just guiding us in these things. Let's pray, and then I'll hand back to you, uh, Jello. Thank you, Lord, for this man, Job. Thank you. Lord, will you teach us what true worship is, please? 
Will you cause every area of our lives to be worshipped, Lord? No matter where we find ourselves, no matter what befalls us, that we might be worshippers of God. And Lord, when our day comes, our final day may be, may be said of us like it was said of Moses. He was a servant of the Lord. Let that be our testimony, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.